how many will just spend way too many seconds focusing on their acting partner or their reactions, they would be dead. Hello, everyone. Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night. My guest today needs no introduction, slash I can't even give her one because there are so many things I'd want to name drop right now. Christine Baranski, welcome to the show. Thank you. I am so excited to have you here. I told you before we even started recording, I got a lot of titles I want to hit, but we always start with the show by going back to the very, very beginning. And I like starting with the question, what was the movie, the show, the performance, or just the personal experience you had that made you first say, I have to be an actor? Mm, that's such an interesting question because it really, it wasn't an actor per se, that it was uh, the feeling that I wanted to be a performer. And from childhood, I grew up um, with my father's mom living in the house with us. In fact, we shared a bedroom and she was actually an actress. And my grandfather was an actor and they worked in the Polish theater in Buffalo, New York. And she was a really vivacious um, woman, very colorful personality. And my parents and my grandparents, they loved uh, theater, they loved music, they loved dance. And I would go and see performances of Polish singers and dancers, or I'd hear my parents singing in a choir, or, you know, my Nana, this Auntie Mame type grandma that I had, she actually wrote a comedy show on the Polish radio station, and she she had a lot of theatrical friends. So from a very early age, I was surrounded by a kind of theatrical energy and a, and a love for the performing arts that then continued uh, as I uh, got to school and I began to see performances. I had a cousin who did musicals at her high school and I saw her do Brigadoon and West Side Story and there was my cousin Sandy doing the lead and I was just utterly enthralled. And then I started doing theater in high school and um, I did MAME as the senior class musical and I, you know, I played MAME. So holding the album of you know the original cast recording of Mame and just staring at Angela Lansbury's picture as though her spirit would infuse me and and you know make me a great Mame I mean I I had a lot of influences but uh yeah I would say it started young to answer your question succinctly so I like how you say performer and not just actor and yeah, one because of I started my father wanted me to study dance so as a little girl, I went to ballet school. And at first I hated it, and then I grew to really love it. So before I was bit with the acting bug, I was dancing and mostly ballet and then ballet and tap, but we'd have recitals and I'd love dancing. I love, I just loved it. Once I started acting and realizing how much I loved talking and singing, then, you know, when it came time to audition uh, after high school, uh, when I auditioned for Juilliard, I actually asked if I could be in both the acting and the dance programs. And they told me it was not possible to intensely study both disciplines. So I pretty much knew at that point I wanted to be an actor. But I did, yeah, performing is what I think I was, I fell in love with the idea of being a performing artist. Speaking of needing to focus on something more intensely while you're at Juilliard, even when you graduated, I feel, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I feel like you were doing a little of everything in every different medium right from the beginning. Did you ever have anyone encourage you when you started your career to focus on one particular medium, whether it was film, television, or stage work? Well, actually, I was only focused on theater. I, it never occurred to me that I could go to Hollywood and become a movie star. I wasn't enthralled with films. I mean, I loved going and seeing movies, but it, you know, in the way that some people just can't wait, you know, they just dream of a film career. I certainly didn't. I dreamt of a theater career. My, as I said, my grandparents were stage actors. And then in um, high school, I did theater. And then Juilliard was 
really focused on theater, not even musical comedy. I didn't study any musical comedy. It was a lot of classical training. But while I was still in high school, I did do some avant-garde theater work. This was the late 60s, and the University of Buffalo had a really interesting creative associates program. And I was part of a theater workshop with kids from all over the city. And we did experimental theater and Afro-Cuban dancing, and, and we wound up going to Bedford-Stuyvesant. So I had a little bit of, you know, what it would have been like to be you know, work with Peter Brook or Joe Chaikin and do avant-garde theater. But then I really wanted to audition for Juilliard and I got in. And then my training was rather like an English um, actor's training. Lots of speech and voice, lots of classical plays. So when I graduated from Juilliard, I had done a lot of, a lot of period work as well as contemporary. But I didn't, at that time, I had no longing to be, um, on television or um, I, I didn't even think I could be, you know, in the movies. It was all, you know, I wanted to go to New York and be a theater actress. I wanted to be a great theater actress. Little did you know you could do everything. <laughs> well, um, you know, I think the training was very good because uh, the Juilliard training, I had to go from one, one kind of play to another, one period to another. And I became adaptable at, you know, there's Shakespeare and then there's, you know, John Guare and there's all different styles of plays and period pieces. And I, and I developed, I think, a flexibility, but I was mostly, you know, into my late 20s. I finally, I think, did my first little role on film in my mid 20s, late 20s. And my theater career continued into my 30s. And then television came according because you know, I won a couple of Tonys and then producers like Carsey Warner Company, they were looking for talent. You know, the sitcom was all the rage in the 80s and 90s. And uh, I never wanted to, you know, go to Hollywood and do a sitcom. By then I was raising children and I didn't want to give up my theater career. I thought that would compromise me. But anyway, I didn't make the jump to television until my early 40s. But curiously, television then opened up my film career because once I kind of scored in this sitcom called Sybil, the Sybil Shepherd show, suddenly it opened up film directors like Mike Nichols asked me to do The Birdcage and Warren Beatty. I did Bullworth and Ron Howard, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So curiously, my film and TV career actually started blossoming in my 40s. <laughs> That's a little late start, isn't it? <laughs> To give people hope. Carol? Carol, uh, we are almost ready. My darling, I still don't see why I can't meet the man I'm going to be working with. Well, I just spoke with Kid. He wants to impress you so much with his acting and he needs his total concentration. Oh, that's just young. I know. I wish just once I could work with someone who would hone the craft. Right, but right now we need that scene, Carol. You'll get your scene. He may not be a professional, but I am. By my early 30s, I was in a big Broadway hit directed by Mike Nichols, Tom Stoppard's The Real Thing. And then I started doing Broadway and I did Neil Simon and John Guare. And I was working at the Manhattan Theater Club and playing lead roles. So I just was, you know, I was just one of those actors who was always working, always working in the theater. And that's where my skill set lie. So I, I feel I had a lot to learn when I then began to do television and um, the theater training really helped me enormously with doing sitcoms because you have to repeat your performance and land a laugh and of course I had done so much comedy on stage that I was very comfortable in that genre but you know I'm still learning how to work in front of a camera and be a better actor in front of uh, you know in a close-up because the you know it's it's very different from theater it's not as you know, you don't use your whole body. You can you can communicate so much with just not doing anything but thinking. You already name dropped a whole bunch of titles I want to touch on. But before I get away from uh, theater, I am always curious to hear about someone's relationship with awards. And <laughs> back in the day, you get your very first Tony Award. What mm -hmm. What did that major win do for you, just as far as it opening the door to more opportunities, but also 
did it change how you looked at awards in general? Like, did you go down the path of now feeling that pressure? Like I have to keep getting them or like, I got it. I'm good. I'm gonna do my thing and not have to worry about it. You know, I was so lucky because my first Tony Award nomination resulted in a win. And it was a fantastic win because I was in a production in which Jeremy Irons, Glenn Close, and I all won Tony Awards, as did Tom Stoppard, as did Mike Nichols, and as did The Best Revival. So I was in heavy company, and it was just, I mean, getting the nomination was thrilling. Winning was thrilling. Um, and then I actually thought to myself, if it never happens again, I did it. You know, I was nominated and I did it. And the second time I was nominated, I won again, which is, you know, that's very lucky. It was three or four years later, I won for a Neil Simon play. That said, oh yes, and then when I was nominated for, my, for an Emmy for Sybil, that was my first Emmy nomination. And I had barely sat down because my car was late, so I barely sat down in my seat when they were announcing Best Supporting Actress. And it was Kelsey Grammer and David Hyde Pierce, two actors with whom I'd worked in the theater, and they announced my name. So on my first Emmy nomination, I won. Now, that all sounds great, except I have subsequently been nominated for Emmys, how many times? I don't know. I don't know, 10? I'm now a consistent loser. I know how to, I know how to lose gracefully. I never expect them to call my name, but I get all dressed up and I do that whole thing of being grateful. And, but in my heart, I know what it's like to win. And I know what it's like to win. The first time you get nominated, you win. And it's like, okay, okay, I've done it. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't make me like, oh, damn, I can't bear being a loser. I'm used to being a winner, no. Also getting the nomination is a form of winning. It is, and to get that many nominations, it's mostly, you know, for The Good Wife, you know, I did for seven years, and I think I was nominated every year except one. Um, but, you know, these are, these are what I call champagne problems. Losing awards, this is, this is not a hardship. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now some specific, let's start with some feature titles. I was really excited to ask you about this one, The Ref, because I want to oh, know about your experience working with Ted on that. Oh, In particular, what like what is something unique that he brought to set as an actor's director? And also, what was it like watching the shorthand that he must have established with uh, Dennis Leary at the time? Ted was just so fluid, so cool, so... I mean, he played basketball. I mean, that to me was like, that was Ted. He just moved around on the court. He was, he had that wonderful physicality and that wonderful sense of humor and that sharp intelligence, but he was playful. And it's great to be with a playful person on any level creatively. Somebody who just, you know, is not rigid, has got not fixed in, you know, it's gotta be a certain way. He, you just, you know, it was a fun set. And, you know, come on with Dennis Leary, it was just crazy. It's still, I mean, people still will come up to me and say, slipper socks, medium. <laughs> That's like in the, um, in the reversal of fortune, my line, get the Jew, I told him. That seems to be a line that no one can forget either, even though we tried to dub it because it's so politically incorrect. <laughs> With everything you've done, what do you get approached about the most? This is, I think, one of the things I love most and is most gratifying about my career. I never know what people are going to say. They might say something I did at the Manhattan Theater Club. This morning I did a talk show and this technician came up to me and he said, oh, my 16-year-old just loves you. And then he mentioned, I, what did he mention? Cruel intentions or something that I'd done so long ago. And I, it was just, I said to him, oh, mama mia, you know, you think mama mia. No, no. He, what he said, he, he said the birdcage. 
his 16 year old watches the birdcage. I like that my career is that eclectic, that, that I'm not known for any one thing. Actually, before I go to another specific title, more of a general question for you, because I'm always fascinated by the idea of carving the path that you want that speaks to the types of projects and roles you want to bring out to the world. So was there any particular project or experience that kind of put that into focus for you? There are times in my career I definitely felt I had to be brave and, and make a decision. And that was, you know, the, the biggest one, of course, was choosing to do television. I was so passionate about being a theater actor. And when Carsey Warner uh, asked me to consider doing uh, The Best Friend in Sybil, I, I, could, I could tell just reading the script that that role had something, you know, she was really, really witty and it was well written, but I was so ambivalent. I. I lay awake the night before I had to read for the network and I thought of calling my agent saying, I can't get on the plane. I just can't get on that plane because it was a big life decision. I had children. I didn't want ever to work in LA. It would have meant working in LA. So there were life decisions as well. And there was also that feeling like, do I really want to be a television actress? And they only give you one script, you know, it's only the pilot script. And yet the network wants you to sign on for how many years, five, seven. It terrified me at the commitment of doing it. But the script was written by a man named Chuck Lorre, who is now one of the most successful men in television history. And he wrote that role. He, uh, and I smelled it off the page that that, you know, just the rhythm of it and the, the one-liners, I thought, you know, I think I could really do something with this. And um, the network actually didn't want me. The network head didn't want me. But I read for Carsey Warner in the network and I got the role and it opened up my career. Like, pff, suddenly I went from being a theater actress to an actor who, you know, the, how ubiquitous television is. Suddenly everybody was seeing me. It was like, who is this? new girl in town. She was only like 41 years old, new girl in town. But um, yeah, it opened up my career. And while I was doing Sybil, I got offered movie roles. And, and so that was a, a brave decision, a, a scary decision, but one that I'm still working for CBS. I'm still working for that network. And it opened up not only television, but more important film roles. So, you know, it was a brave decision though, yeah. And a good one at that. Was there anything about your experience on Sybil and that being your first time working on a long running show that you still find coming in handy today, maybe on The Good Wife and The Good Fight? The sitcom came very easily to me. I did a guest appearance on Frasier. I did a few other sitcoms and that came easy to me because it's in front of a, uh, you know, you do it in front of an audience. Oh, and the Big Bang Theory, of course, I, I didn't, I did Leonard's Mother on that. That came easily, you know, the doing uh, drama that didn't come until I was in my fifties. I had done MAME when I turned, uh, no, I didn't, what, Sweeney Todd at the Kennedy Center when I turned 50. And that was my first big, really big, juicy musical role. And then a few years later, I did MAME. But um, yeah, after that, I got a call about doing um, the, good, the Good Wife. And I'd never done TV drama before, but I felt, I remember saying to my manager, you know, I've done all of these things. I've done theater and I've done comedy. I've done sitcom, I've done musicals. The one thing I really wish I could get now is a TV role of a, a woman of authority, like a professional woman, um, intelligent, well-dressed, and, you know, just who has a kind of force. And, and wouldn't that be wonderful to get a role like that on television? And there it was. Um, I think shortly after my manager said, there's this one show that's the, the best written show of the pilot season. And because I had a history with CBS, uh, and oddly enough, I was going flying out to LA to speak when Chuck Lorre, Chuck Lorre was being given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I went straight from that ceremony to a meeting, on my way to the airport, to a meeting 
with um, the Kings who wrote The Good Wife and David Zucker from Ridley Scott's company and the director. And it was just, I remember going to the ladies room and re reapplying my makeup and just going into this meeting and talking about, you know, well, my ideas for possibly this character and all. And um, I got that role and um, I'm still doing that character. <laughs> I think I'm going on, what am I doing? <sighs> I'm on year 12. Wait, I did 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, I'm going into year 12 as Diane Lockhart. So you would think I'm primarily a television actress, but that's not really so. You know, a dramatic television actress is like now at the, I don't want to say the tail end of my life, but it's, you know, it's, you know, farther down the, way further down the road. Is there anything <laughs> you haven't, have you been in a horror movie? No, and I don't think it's my genre. I don't think I'd like it. I beg to differ. I feel like you could do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to another title, you already brought up The Birdcage. Oh, I, yeah. I have to ask about working with Robin Williams because I know you guys share a bunch of scenes in that movie, but it's the first scene that the two of you are in that every single time I watch it, it's just the chemistry and the kindness between those characters just oozes off screen and I can't get enough of it. You know, I'm so proud of that scene. It, it moves me on a number of levels. Robin, without a doubt, is one of the most talented people who ever worked and with whom I ever worked. We were both Juilliard grads and he, I remember him in the halls of Juilliard. He was a few years below me. But what I love about that scene is it's not unlike it's it's not like the scene in the in the French movie and the French movie I think is brilliant but the one scene I didn't like in the French movie was the scene between the mother and the you know the, the those two people she just seemed to me too abrupt in her seduction and she just went for the you know went for the bottle and suddenly she, her hands are all over him and I thought that's just felt unearned to me and like, why would a, a, a gay man, you know, respond in any aggressive way like that? I mean, respond to an aggression from a woman like that, even though they had a past. So I said to Mike, why don't we just take time with the beginning of it? And, and Mike liked my sitting on the desk with my legs crossed and it's sort of a Mrs. Robinson camera angle of him looking up at my legs. and. It, it's the scene now has a kind of slow rediscovery. It gets sexy because they're remembering back in their youth when, you know, they had too much to drink and suddenly they were in bed together. And then they redo the song, you know, they sing that song and it reminds them of, you know, the time when they were, you know, doing that together. And you can kind of feel the, the, the thing happen in the moment. And when he lifts me up and all, there is something very, it's like a remembered intimacy. And I think there's a sweetness to that scene. It's one of my favorite scenes I've ever done on film. And because something just happens in the moment between those two people and that, and that little song, like they're trying to remember the lyrics and, and the, and the rhythm of the song and um, getting the, 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 intervals right there's something really sweet about it yeah and that the way that scene kind of reverberates throughout the rest of the movie and what they're up to i feel like that level of sweetness and respect for one another is really important mm. yes it's a very human story and i i think it's just one of his best pieces of work you know he chose robin chose not to play the really flamboyant role he chose the other role and i find that his serious moments in that film are so deep and so heartfelt. All right, this next one I warned you about, Adam's Family Values. I've grown up watching it too many times and I still watch it and adore it to this yes. day. I, I'm happy to say I've done so many Christmas movies, but that is a Thanksgiving movie, isn't it? It is, and that's the, so I have a million different scenes and lines I could ask you about, but I have to ask about the big Thanksgiving show in particular and what uh, that was like on set from your perspective, because for the viewer, the entire thing plays as really wonderfully wild and kind of chaotic, but 
are you getting that full picture while you're there shooting it or is it just your angle? It's just your angle, but you know, Peter McNichol and I, we had so much fun. He's best sense of humor. And he and I just went with playing the audacity of those characters. And I love Paul Rudnick. Uh, subsequently did a off-Broadway play of Paul Rudnick's. And also it was in Jeffrey. So I, you know, uh, I think that, I think Adam's Family Values was the first thing I did of Paul Rudnick's. But I love his sense of humor and it just, some of it was just hard to keep a straight face. You know, the turkey, turkey lyrics and the line about shampoo, we have shampoo and you brought us corn and, and we brought you shampoo. I, I, it's just, it's so Paul Rodnick. Was <laughs> Were there any lines in that that were improvised or is everything oh, you no, got? I don't think so. I don't remember. You don't have to improvise Paul Rudnick. Yeah. <laughs> he gives you everything. The wonderful thing, I, I have worked with so many brilliant writers. I've just mouthed the words of so many brilliant writers. And now I'm doing Lord Julian Fellows. I'm doing The Gilded Age and, and Robert and Michelle King, who write The Good Fight. They're such brilliant writers. I've always felt I'm in good hands. You know, I, I do wonderful material. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. No, this next question isn't necessarily about the material, but for Mamma Mia, I heard a lot about the, the Uzo on set. Oh, <laughs> Apparently really? there was only one. No, there wasn't ever Uzo on set. It was that Pierce Brosnan wanted to take us all to dinner one night near the end of the shoot, the first Mamma Mia. And we had dinner and then we went to hear some jazz music somewhere and we started drinking this, it's not called Uzo, it's start Cipro or something, but that sounds like the, the antibiotic, but it sounds something like Cipro. Anyway, none of us knew it, but this thing that we were drinking as though it was just really good tequila and gives you this hangover after the next day if you have even a little bit of water, it reactivates the effect of this drink. And I remember I didn't have to work the next day, but I couldn't, I had to keep reading the same paragraph. I was sitting by the pool and trying to read this Greek history book. And I, I kept reading and rereading and nothing would stick. It was this crazy, whatever we were drinking, it was Uzo-esque. <laughs> Whoa, powerful stuff. And I think I think all three guys and Meryl had to just shoot a final scene. But fortunately, I think the camera was behind them all day. They were doing Sophie sailing out to see it. <laughs> I don't think their faces had to be seen because everybody was like, whoa. Was Mamma Mia an especially special ensemble? Oh my God. It was a love affair. It, you know, Judy Kramer is a great producer and, and she wants to have fun and she'll, she will treat her actors extremely well. So there were dinners and there were parties and just being on, can you imagine being on a Greek island with Pierce Brosnan and Colin Firth and Stellan and then Meryl and Judy and I mean and then Cher came on board in the second one we I was just we all wanted to do it again if we could you know if we could manage it we'd we want to do it every few years we'd want to do the Mamma Mia three four five <laughs> I don't think anyone out there would have a problem with it it does sound like that specific set was a unique experience but if you could take something the producers did on Mamma Mia and bring it to other film and tv sets just to I don't know create a, a better more fulfilling experience what what would it be film everything on a Greek island <laughs> that's fair yeah. everything <laughs> should take place on a Greek island a beautiful Greek island I like and that. Bring the cast together every night for Cipro or Uzo or well, I don't know, Retsina, whatever. And then the dancing, and then you show up on the set the next day and you're a little underslept, but having fun. Sign me up for that routine. <laughs> but no, to answer your question actually specifically, 
I think I remember saying to Meryl, you know, the secret to the success of this will be if the audience sees that we're genuinely having fun doing this movie, doing this material. You know, we're, we're doing dialogue and suddenly we bro break out into ABBA songs and there's something kind of ludicrous about it. It's the way Mamma Mia is. All of a sudden you're singing a famous ABBA song. But if your tongue is kind of in your cheek and the audience knows, just come along for this ride. This is fun. And I think always in your heart as a performer, you should have that feeling like, come on, you know, come on board. I'm, I'm having a playful, wonderful time. Come, come and join me, you know, albeit you don't always get ABBA songs to accompany your, your work, but um, you know, you have to have that generosity. I don't think you guys could have been any more successful in that department on those movies. <laughs> I, th I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself here. I want to go back to the Grinch because the Grinch. you mm. have, you have some of the most exciting material in that movie where I feel like you're right smack in the middle of some of the biggest set pieces. So right. what is it like having all of that go on around you? And then also just seeing Jim go all out as the Grinch. I, I, I had developed so much admiration for him because I saw on a daily basis what he had to go through to trans just transform himself physically into that character. And most of his work was done in a cave with a small child and or dog up, you know, somewhere in the universal back lot. And he was covered from head to toe in the, the, the green hair and, he, and his, he, his fingers were covered, his eyeballs were covered in gigantic green lenses. The prosthetic took hours to, you know. So, and then he had to exude all of that manic energy. So it was great, it was great to be, like with Robin Williams, you think I'm with one of the great comedians and I get to see up close. And I was his love interest, which was fun. But yes, it was like a great big Hollywood movie. Mamma Mia was like that, but The Grinch was uh, was done on the biggest soundstage at Universal. And it just took over the entire soundstage and we had to create, Ron Howard just created the entire world of Whoville. And every day we would enter and just be part of this very heightened reality. Um, but I made a brilliant acting choice. I didn't realize how brilliant it was until Jeffrey Tambor remind, you know, said, oh, I see, you've decided to faint early in that scene. So now you're spending days lying on the floor while the rest of us have to keep reacting. And, all. and, and it's true. Uh, I think I faint at the sight of the, the Grinch. I don't know what he did, but I just pass out. And I think it's scripted, but maybe it wasn't scripted. But I, I wound up lying there in my huge costume, which was so uncomfortable. I was just lying there and Jeffrey would say, you bitch, you, how, how did you come up with that idea to faint? Okay, I have like a little bit of a weird question to go off of that. What's a seemingly little thing that you that you still find challenging? It's like when you say uh, fainting, it makes me think of the difficulty of believably waking up from being asleep or something like doing a fake sneeze. The little things that we don't necessarily think of as huge uh, performance challenges. Yeah, it, it's especially on camera. I know what you mean, waking up from sleep. Oh, no, I'll tell you the one that is really and most actors, you can tell they, they, they don't quite right, is driving. Because you're never really driving, uh, especially if it's fast. You have a, you know, the camera's attached to the car and maybe men are pulling the car or it's a green screen and you're, you can be playing scenes with someone or someone's in the back seat and you're driving, right? Well, you watch a lot of actors. If, if, when you're actually driving a car, you rarely, have a conversation like this, do you? No. But watch how many actors, because there's also a camera, you know, to your right, that, that we, how many will just spend way too many seconds focusing on their acting partner or their reactions? They would be dead. They would be dead by then. So I try whenever I have a car scene 
to make sure my eyes are doing the right thing. You know, you, you, you wouldn't be looking like that. You know, your eyes would just be moving subtly to the left or the right, or they'd be looking in the rear view mirror. But um, yeah, driving. It's a good one. <laughs> uh, I have another very random question for you. Uh -huh. Are you in Greece? No. Because I know this went on with the Brady Bunch. Completely false. There's another one of those out there where people just assume you are in everything. <laughs> that woman has been around. She is. In, I'm like, where's Waldo? <laughs> Prepared for many episodes of Ladies Night where I've like dug deep. And this is the first time I've seen as much of that. <laughs> Never. I was not in Greece and I was never a child actor. The little girl in the Brady Bunch, I didn't even look like that when I was a little girl, but you could believe the little girl was me. My daughters tell me about this stuff and sometimes they, they send it to me, but I don't, I think it's a rabbit hole. I just want to keep moving forward and doing things and, and not, you know, get caught up. Very understandable, but there is lots of good yeah. stuff out there. Just okay, so you know. that's good. So two more TV questions for you here. Just because of the nature of the good fight, I'm wondering if you have any predictions or any ideas you might know of, of how the show's energy might change with a new presidency on the horizon. Boy, that's the $64 million question. Uh, I talked to the writers, they were just opening up the writer's room and they did not know. They did not know. I'm, I'm hoping by now a week later, they have some idea because do you or I know, does anybody know what inauguration day is going to be like? I, you know, our show, the, the, the wonderful thing about The Good Fight is it really takes place as much as possible in, in the here and now. It takes place in this historical moment, which is why when, you know, we were shooting the pilot and Donald Trump won the presidency instead of Hillary Clinton. We had to make a U-turn and happily we made the show about Diane's obsession and, and inability to cope with life in, uh, in the Trump era. But now that he's gone, but will he be gone? And are we going to be living in a post-truth world? Are we going to be living with conspiracy theories? And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know a plus to say nothing of, of uh, you know COVID and how are we going to do how are we going to work in the office? Are we going to have masks on? Are we all going to Zoom? You know, I I I don't know what they'll do for the new season, but it'll it will be very ingenious because that's who they are. Yeah, I feel like uh, that show leaning into current events like that it makes me hope that it goes on as long as you would like it to go on. I know, because this show could go on because history will go on and it's going to probably get even more crazy than it's already been. So I, I really was very happy to be on the show at, at a moment in time when people, people were questioning what is going on in our in our culture and in our democracy and we were actually doing a show with characters who were asking those same questions and trying to keep their bearing as lawyers and asking moral questions and ethical questions how do we deal with living in this dystopian era and i don't think any other show really addressed it as directly as the good fight Nothing that I watch, I can assure you that. Mm -hmm. I lie. I don't want to ask about a specific TV title. I want to give you a very broad, general question about working with other actors, because you've arguably worked with almost all of the greats out there. So of everyone you've worked opposite, whose process would you say is the most similar to your own? And then who challenged you to adapt the most? Working with Mark Rylance on stage was very challenging because he came in with his performance from having done it in London. He knew he had his his results in place in a way. So it was it was a question of it, it took us a long time to dance together, uh, but that was in Boeing Boeing on stage, and I have such enormous respect for him as an actor, and we're we're now dear friends. Um, in terms of uh, fluidity and and do you know honestly working with Meryl she doesn't have an exact science to her method I wouldn't 
ever deign to compare myself to her, but she's very intuitive and very, oh, let's, okay, there's this, and what about this, and what about this? And I tend to like that way of approaching work where it's not rigid, it does, doesn't exist first, you know, in your head, and then you come in and try and make it happen as it's in your head, but see what's out there between yourself and the other actors or imaginatively like, oh, here's a, here's a teacup and I haven't even had this tea and now it's cold, but now I'm talking to you and, you know, I could incorporate that into my, into my work. Um, it's, she's a very present performer. She just deals so fully with exactly what's going on, which is why I think she's a great, as great as she is, you know, she's just so there. But uh, I, I would say I admire that technique, that, that fluidity that she has. Hearing that does not surprise me one bit about her, given everything she's yeah. done. So we have come to the end of Ladies' Night, and we always wrap with some very random questions, things that I just think of on the spot. Oh, the first okay. one I want to ask you is, what is the last TV show or movie you watched? Oh, I'm watching The Queen's Gambit. It's utterly mesmerizing. And I thought, oh, chess? come on, chess. I'm not going to, you know, oh, you know, hours go by and I'm still, whoa, watching it. <laughs> Does it give you the itch to play chess at all? It kind of does, but I also think, oh, I'd be so bad at this, you know, thinking 10 steps, 13 steps, 20 steps ahead. But you know what What I love about it is it's very, it's very challenging as an actor to convince an audience that, that you're just the drama of thinking. This, this actress, this brilliant actress, you're, totally taken into her world and she's doing nothing this is no dialogue she's moving chess pieces but you're riveted by her thinking and i think ultimately great acting has more to do with what's going on you know film acting is it's going on up there it's not you know waving your arms around and emoting it's like more what is the interior life of the character and that is an example of really interior acting. What is the most precious thing you have that you've kept from a set? Oh, 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 oh. Oh God. Uh, I must have something. I, I don't hang pictures of myself everywhere and all. I just, as I said, somewhere there's memorabilia. I do. I do have, um, somebody gave me a piece of the set from Sweeney Todd and I have it in my office, Mrs. Lovett's Pie Shop. That was one of the great theater experiences of my life. And I got to work with Stephen Sondheim on many occasions, but that was a very special show. So yeah, my Mrs. Lovett's Pie Shop plaque. <laughs> I like that. All right, this last one is a bit of a deep question. I have a habit of ending on it all the time and you could go you could go deep, you can keep it light, whatever you prefer. I just always find that this could be helpful for someone else out there to hear who might admire you and your work. What is your biggest fear that you've actually managed to overcome? Oh, I don't know if I've overcome it, but um, I, I have a fear fear of, of losing my, my skill, my fluidity, my, my speed as a performer. And so staying sharp, keeping healthy, keeping, I, you know, I had to talk to the Juilliard students or I was given an opportunity at their graduation a few years ago. And I thought, how do I talk to performers? Cause they were musicians. And I, and I, I decided to make it about being present in, a, in an age when we're so distracted and, you know, people just go off and they're looking at their phones or their computers, that, that there's, you can only be a great performing artist if you're fully present in the moment, mentally, spiritually, physically. So you have to do everything you can to enhance your health or your, men, your mental health, your, your emotional state. You've got to stay in that place where you can give a thousand percent of yourself on the stage, in front of a camera, over and over, 
14 hours into a film day on your eighth performance on Broadway, whatever, you've got to show up. And showing up is the essence of great performance. I'll leave you with that.